I'm a New Jersey kid, yet there were days or there were summers where my family decided to uh, spend some time in Maine. And I remember one time we went up to our house that we were staying at, and I was about 12 years old. And it was located by a river, and you walk down toward the river. There was a rowboat there for our use. And so I said, you know, wouldn't it be cool to just take the rowboat across the river? This was the Thomas River, which led out to the Muscongas Bay, which led out to the Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, you know, I uh, wasn't a water person. I really didn't know much about it, but I knew enough to row. So I got in, untied the boat, and just started rowing with my you know, feet up against the stern of the rowboat, and rowing and seeing the dock slowly receding, bit by bit, stroke by stroke. And it was a beautiful day, and I just kind of remember feeling the sun and letting the salty air blow through my hair and just looking down and not really paying any mind. And I remember rowing and then looking up and saying, where did the dock go? I mean, I wasn't all that far from the shoreline, but I just couldn't see the dock. It was way over there. Because of what apparently had been happening, for every 10 feet I've been rowing this way, a swift current was taking me out to sea 20 feet that way. And I realized if I didn't do something about it fairly quickly, I would be out in the Atlantic Ocean in a rowboat. And I didn't want to be there. So I, I started furiously rowing, and end of the story later. But I'll tell you, what happened is, you know, I lost track. I lost orientation. I drifted. Does that ever happen to you spiritually, that you just drift? And the funny thing about drifting is that when you're drifting, you're normally unaware that you're drifting. You don't know that it's going on. And more than that, once you discover you're drifting, uh, the harder it becomes to get back on track the longer you wait in drift mode. More than that, have you ever realized, too, when it comes to drifting, you never drift against the current. You're always letting life take you with it rather than staying the course. So as we're in Holy Week, as we're coming closer to Resurrection Day, what I want to do is take a few minutes from John to remind us that the resurrection gives us this orientation, this compass that we need to pay attention to because without this resurrection power in our lives, we will drift. And so this resurrection power keeps us where we're going. And in fact, God gives us everything we need through Christ in the power of the resurrection. And for that reason, we must stay the course. And you say, well, you know, what exactly has God given us? Well, th this morning I want to look at three things that John 11 talks about. First of all, God gives us a mission. What is his mission? You know, we all have missions, don't we? When we're younger, I remember being in junior high, my mission was, was just to survive and fit in. And, and then when you get to high school, you start thinking about grades, because you know college is around the corner, so you start paying attention to that. Well, then you're in college, and you know grades matter, but you still the, the fitting in thing still is a piece of it, but there's other things going on. And you're constantly rediscerning your mission. Now, out of college, you say, well, let's go to graduate school. And some of you are here, and you're here because you need discernment on your mission, and you're not even quite sure what your next steps are after graduation. Others of you know exactly what you're going to do and where you're going to go. Others of you are thinking about marriage. Others of you are wondering, will I ever get married? Some of you here might be saying, how am I going to survive in my marriage? That's my mission. You know, we all have a mission. And, and so we all have a personal agenda, but God has his own personal agenda that's larger and looming and subsumes our missions. And maybe the best way to sum it up is uh, to look at verse 4 where Jesus says, No, even death uh, is for God's glory so that God's Son might be glorified through it. So what we see in this passage is that Jesus is going to use death as a lead-up to resurrection where the full glory of God will be made manifest. So if we want, we want to talk about God's mission, if you were to summarize God's mission, you couldn't do much better than to say God's mission is to break in new creation into our world of death. And that's what Jesus is about to do. But the problem is our compasses are often broken. 
And, and so we don't orient our lives around that. And I'll, and I'll give you an, an instance of this, is because sometimes we don't think about life the way Jesus thinks about life. I, I think here about my friends and acquaintances and family members who don't know the Lord. I think this passage has something to say about that. In, in fact, uh, look with me uh, down to the end of the pack passage. You know, Jesus seems to say that if you're going to share this new creation life with people, with others who don't know him, then you're going to need to be absolutely convinced of at least three convictions. The first conviction is this, is that your friends are dead. Those who are outside of Christ are dead. I mean, that's what verse 11 says. He, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. And the disciples aren't quite sure what he means by that. So Jesus clarifies in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. Now, Lazarus is physically dead, but I believe John intends this as a metaphor for spiritual death as well. Because the truth is, is that people who haven't come to Christ for his forgiveness, uh, they are not only outside of Christ, they are dead spiritually. Now, sometimes that's hard for me to believe because I know a lot of people who don't claim the name, name the name of Christ, who are pretty accomplished people. In fact, I know this one guy, his garage is bigger than my house. And, and it seems like he, his family has it completely together. I mean, the kids are going to be either future models or future road scholars or both. They're always well behaved. You know, I, I, give, us a, I give ourselves a red prize uh, when we come home from church and we're not bickering in the car. And so I'm supposed to believe that this family here who is outside of Christ is dead and we're alive, and some days that's hard to believe. But that's what the Scripture says. Those who don't know Jesus, those who are outside of his resurrection power, oh, they're dead. But there's a second point here, and that's this, is that Jesus is on a journey to raise the dead. And that's what he says here, verse 14, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Jesus is on a journey to save the dead and to raise the dead and to bring those outside of Christ back to him. But there's a third point here, and that is we must go with Jesus on that journey. Notice that Jesus says, let us go to him. Interestingly, he doesn't say, Lazarus is dead, let's go wake him up. He says, that's my business. Only Jesus can raise the dead. That's important to keep in mind. There's nothing I can do, there's nothing you can do to raise the dead. But Jesus says, let us go to him. Jesus invites us on the journey to be part of that. And we know that because later on in the chapter, when Jesus comes to the empty tomb, he just doesn't say shazam and the stone rolls, you know, breaks apart and Lazarus comes out. He says, roll the stone away. I need your help. This is a team effort. And that's the way it is with God's mission. God's mission is always a team effort. Jesus is the one taking initiative. Jesus is the one raising the dead. But we have to go with him on the journey and be willing. And sometimes, friends, that's hard for me. Because, you know, sometimes I'm praying for people, I'm praying for certain family members for years to come to know him. And, and, and I can almost hear Jesus saying, well, will you go with me? I say, Lord, you don't need me with you. You know, you can do this by yourself. You can wave that magic wand. And Jesus is saying, no, well, you're my magic wand. Even though there's no power in you, you're going with me. We get confused, I think, because we lose track of the resurrection power. We lose track of what this is all about. And Easter reminds us of this. Now, the thing is, Jesus has already talked about his glory. Uh, he's talked about Lazarus falling asleep. And it's interesting, the disciples really don't understand what he's talking about at first, right? They're saying, well, Jesus, if he gets some sleep and some good chicken soup, he'll get better, right? Duh. And then Jesus then has to clarify very explicitly what he's talking about. Now, if it's me communicating with 12 grown men and they don't get what I'm saying, I would say that's on me. I'm not communicating clearly. 
But this is Jesus we're talking about. And the problem is, the problem is, the disciples think they're speaking the same language as Jesus, but they're really not. He's speaking a different language. Let me illustrate it this way. Years ago, we, we lived in the UK, and when we got to the UK, wanted to open up a bank account at NatWest, you know, you go in, your name, address, blah, 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 you know, date of birth, blah, 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 all your account details. We had our bank account. After three years in the UK, we come back to the United States. A year after that, I go back to London, and I need some money. I just, I left the bank account open, and so I go to the teller, and I said, I'd like to withdraw some money. And they said, well, Mr. Perrin, because your account has been active for a while, we need you to see the manager. So I sit down with the manager, and the manager says, okay, well, we just have a question for you. Uh, what's your date of birth? And I said, 09-05-64. And she says, nope. No? I think I know my own birthday. How about September 5th, 1964? No, sorry. And then I just wondered. I said, ah, how about May 9th, 1964? And she gave me this crazy look, but she said, you're absolutely right. How did you guess? <laughs> and the answer is, of course, because everyone knows, in the UK, they do dates and months backwards. <laughs> On that side of the pond, you, you first mention the date, and then you mention the month. On this side of the pond, it's the date and month. Don't anyone let anyone tell you that we all speak the same language. We don't. Now, in the same way, the disciples and Jesus are on, the two, on different sides of the same pond of death. The disciples are thinking about sleep in worldly terms. Jesus is already operating in resurrection power, new creation reality, where he realizes that death is really but sleep. And so it seems backwards to them that Jesus has it backwards, but it's the disciples that have it backwards. And so part of the thing about Easter is it's a time where we come back to getting our upside-down world right-sided to his reality, that, that death is not normal, that death is, is not the reality, that it's asleep to a much greater reality of new creation. Well, I've spent a lot of time on the mission. Let me just talk about the means. What are the means that Jesus is going to accomplish uh, this uh, mission with? Well, first of all, it's God's guidance. Look at verse 7, if you have your Bibles. Jesus says, let us go back to Judea. And the, and the disciples say, but Rabbi, but Rabbi, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and you were going back there. But Rabbi, the disciples are pushing back. And we get that because we know that in John chapter 8, when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, they started picking up the stones to stone Jesus. Uh, the, and, and we know, too, in, at the end of John chapter 10, in the time of Hanukkah, they're looking for stones with which to stone Jesus. And now the disciples and Jesus are up in the north country. Jesus is saying, let's go back down south, maybe a two or three day journey. And let's, let's do something about Lazarus. And they're saying, are you crazy? I mean, they missed you the first time, they missed you the second time, but maybe three, three times will be the charm. And so they, they've got different ideas, and they say, but Rabbi, we don't like that idea. And, and you know, that's the way it is, because it, it, notice this, this term Rabbi. In and, and John chapter 1, they call Jesus Rabbi, but they also call him Messiah, Son of God. And now... In John chapter uh, 11, he's been demoted to rabbi. So, so why is it, you see, every, every time God wants to do something in our lives, every time he wants to promote us, we have a way of demoting him. Well, whenever the, the great physician has a diagnosis for us, we say, I want a second opinion. When, when we say, when he says that I'm going to Make, you, make your life in Christ great. I'm going to magnify my glory in you. We want to minimize him. God, working in Christ, is leading us. And we have to be open to the leading. And Jesus answers this way in verse 9. Aren't there 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by the day won't stumble, for he sees by this world's light is when he walks by night that he stumbles. 
And so it is, you see, when we walk by Easter light, that's when we're going to walk properly. When we walk by this, this resurrection reality, doing risk management in light of the cross and the empty tomb, that's when we'll accomplish the mission. So the means is God's guidance. That's the first means. But the second means comes from ourselves. It's our very lives. You see what Thomas says in verse 16? Thomas called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let's also go with him that we may die with him. Now, some commentators say Thomas is being sarcastic, but I don't think so. I do think Thomas is doing some chest thumping and saying, yeah, come on, guys. And, uh, you know, when push comes to shove, Thomas won't do so well. But he is saying, I'm willing to lay down my life. And that's what Jesus asks of us, too, to lay down our lives. I went to Maine again last summer, and on the way I stopped in a town in southeast New Hampshire called Exeter. In this town of Exeter, there's a bridge, and on the bridge there's a plaque dedicated to a man who died in the Afghan war, and he died in the year 2005, all as part of Operation Red Wing. Some of you might have seen the movie Lone Survivor, which tells the story about four Navy SEALs who are besieged by uh, Afghani militia. And so in response, the Navy sent a chopper of 16 men in, and the 16 men in attempting to rescue the four was just shot down out of the sky, and all of them perished. And you, and you see that in the movie. And this plaque was actually commemorating, I believe, the commander of that chopper. And his last words were this. He said, nobody is going to be left behind. Nobody is going to be left behind. And when you think about what Jesus is doing with the disciples, he's taking 12 men, going back down to Judea, and he's undertaking Operation Lazarus, just for one man, risking the life of himself and the 12 others, but all for one. But this is the logic of Easter, that because he is risen, we can give it all. We can spend it all. He demands our lives, and so we give it. Nobody is going to be left behind. That's the resurrection logic. Or as Jim Elliott has put it, and it's so quotable, I'll just quote it for you. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. Third point, motivation. Sorry, I'm really struggling with this. Motivation. If God gives us a mission and gives us the means... There's also got to be a motivation, and friends, how are we motivated this morning? Let me give you just two points here. First, there's God's demonstrated love to us. Look with me at the top of the passage, if you have your Bibles open. There was a man named Lazarus who was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So, obviously, Mary is famous to the readers of the Gospel of John. And this anointing takes place in the next chapter, in John chapter 12, where we are told she takes a, a perfume costing a year's wages and puts it on Jesus' feet. Now, I'm told that the average salary in America is $50,000. So let's just put it in those terms. Imagine you're Mary's father. Middle age, Mary comes home, says, Hey, you know, I got an idea. I, I'm going to anoint Jesus with some perfume. I was wondering if you had $50,000 to give me to buy perfume with. Well, that's pretty much what she's doing. And that's pretty much what she did. She took $50,000, converted it into perfume, and dumped a lot of it on Jesus' feet. Why? Because God had given her brother back. God had essentially raised him from the dead. God's demonstrated love provoked a response in Mary of gratitude. So the Easter reality, the reality that our lives are given back to us, should prompt the same kind of response, that we are willing to give it all. But it's not just God's demonstrated love in the past. My second point is God's demonstrating love in the present. 
He keeps showing his love to us, doesn't he? How does God demonstrate his love in the present? Well, first, through our pain. When Jesus heard this, when he heard the message from Mary and Martha, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Well, what was the message? Verse 3, the sisters had sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Just imagine this. So Mary and Martha find somebody to run a message 100 miles up to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. Anything else you want to say? No, that's it. He'll know, what, he'll know what to do. He'll be here right away. They send the message off. Two days go by. Three days go by. Lazarus is declining, and they're looking out the window. Have you seen Jesus? I haven't seen Jesus. Where's Jesus? Where, where could he be? And then when he eventually shows up, Lazarus had already been dead three or four days. And when Mary and Martha come out individually, and the rest of the chapter shows, they basically say, where were you? Where were you in our pain, Jesus? And see, Jesus doesn't guarantee that he's going to deliver them from pain. Rather, he glorifies himself through pain. And he says this, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son might be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus, and when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. It doesn't make sense, does it? Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, so he didn't show up? I know that some of you are in pain this morning. We all have pains of different sort. Emotional pain, psychological pain, physical pain. And we're wondering, where's Jesus? But you know, part of the secret of Easter is that God takes our pain and converts it to his glory. And that's the last thing to say. God demonstrates his love through our pain under his glory. It's for his glory. He is risen, friends. He's risen ultimately for his glory. Have you aligned your lives to the compass of Easter? Let's pray. Lord, in four more days, we'll be celebrating your resurrection, your rising from the dead. Prepare our hearts, Lord, in these last remaining days. Drive home to us the truth, the power of what you've done. Because you have been raised, we too will be raised. May that resurrection reality overpower our lives, our thinking, our hearts, our emotions, all that we have. Amen.